It's a reformation. <laughs> we need to be reformed. Karen and uh, Pastor Brenda asked me to come and speak with you this morning because I'm in the midst of a major life transition and they thought that perhaps some of that story might touch you where you are in your life, uh, spiritually in your season of life and growth and challenges as well. And for my wife Tracy and I, we've been in Grand Junction 10 years. However, I've been a United Methodist pastor for the last about 22 years. So having served just down the street at First United Methodist Church since 2005, it was a major life transition when in July 1, I left the stained glass sanctuary for a Mustang horse sanctuary. You know, those different kinds of manure. In <laughs> challenge to continue to fulfill God's calling when sometimes you don't feel equipped for that calling. Uh, I remember actually preaching the phrase, and now I'm trying to uh, walk what I talk, in terms of God doesn't call the qualified, God qualifies the call. So there are times when we may not feel quite qualified to fulfill what is necessary that we see a need in the world to help me, and yet we hear that call and we sense it. Uh, somebody in the community is saying it. And the more that that worked on Tracy and, and myself, the more that we knew it was a, a good season for transition for the congregation, uh, for me, the bishop in the United Methodist Church said, you know, yeah, we, we really could use some of your gifts in the front range of Colorado. And I said, we're not leaving Grand Junction. <laughs> we love the people here. Uh, my wife is a four-legged specialist. She works with wild horses and formerly wild horses. So the bookless range, uh, she and Karen serve as friends of the Mustangs here in Grand Junction. Before starting Steadfast Steeds, a Mustang horse sanctuary that we now have on Glade Park, right near the general store up there. Well, we created that in 2005, not because we didn't have anything else to do, but because she couldn't get it out of her heart about the need is so great. And though she is not qualified to meet that need, she definitely feels called to do something about it. You see, while there are horses that still have their families, their freedom, and their familiar way of life, on one of the open ranges in Nevada, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, places like that, in the western U.S., there are still about maybe 20,000-ish horses out there with their freedom, family, familiar way of life. However, currently in the United States, there are 50,000 horses that have lost their families, their freedom, and their familiar way of life. They're in holding corrals, such like Canyon City has about 3,000 horses there, and uh, long-term holding pastures. Either way, when horses are brought in from the ranges, they're separated from their families. Uh, females go this way, males go this way, babies are weaned from their mothers months and months earlier than they would have naturally on the range. And so knowing that there are 50,000 horses in holding facilities. Imagine, that's nearly the population of Grand Junction. All of us being separated from our families. And only you, males only get to live with males for the rest of your lives. Females only with females. And the babies, they're, they're orphaned, meaning they only have each other to model from. They don't have any grown up to teach them boundaries, how to speak horse, how to do horse. Uh, we had a, a, a Mustang horse that came to us last year at four years old. And when he had been gentle enough to be able to have a halter and a lead rope on, I took him out to a grassy area, and he just stood there in the midst of this beautiful spring grass last spring. He didn't do anything. And so I pulled up some grass, and I gave it to him, and he ate it, and he, oh, it was like a kid having candy for the first time. But then he didn't bend down and eat. He just stood there. So I said, dude, it's like this. And I had to like show him how to graze. He had been... Uh, in the holding facility on the dirt lot, he didn't know how to graze. I never thought that a horse wouldn't know how to graze. And so Tracy, not feeling qualified, but feeling called, felt the need to uh, start a sanctuary where we could give horses a new kind of freedom, a new kind of familiarity, living with males and females and young and old alike, and definitely uh, a new purpose uh, to help people. 
which is where I entered because while she's the four-legged specialist, I'm the two-legged specialist. I really love working with people. And usually one of the first questions that we get asked with having a horse sanctuary is, well, how often do you ride? But people like Karen and Mark, who know me pretty well, they say, how long did you ride before you fell off? Because <laughs> I tend to break ribs, puncture a bone, you know, really into myself. <laughs> But quite honestly, I'm much safer if I hop up on one of those little mustangs because they're not very tall, and, and just sit on their back with no bridle, no uh, saddle. That way, if they move, I can just slip off instead of falling and cracking everything in my body. <laughs> and the longer we were working with the horses and seeing how they had transforming impact on the people that were around them, uh, some of the youth from your church, in fact, had come up and volunteered and participated, painting on the horses and being with them. The more that we discern that God is calling us to our competencies and passion to meet the concerns and the purposes in God's world. Uh, the scripture that Charles read for us today talks about being generous and rich in good works. So that, and I, I love that phrase, so that, because it always gives a purpose to whatever statement was just said, so that you may take hold of the life that really is life. We've known that in different seasons of our lives. Ah, this is the life we say. And the, the calling for people of faith is to discern, and it really is a, a challenging discernment process, what am I passionate about? What do I like to do? What am I confident? What are some skills and experience, maybe some education that I have in my background? And then to discern, where do those competencies meet the concerns of the world? And there we have the cross of where Christ working in and through us meets the needs of the people, the animals, the creation around us. Where does my passion meet a needed purpose in my community? And so taking what we are, what we love to do, and then finding out a way that it can meet a need is, is a really sweet spot uh, we talk about in terms of living out our spiritual gifts and who we are in ways that help other people along the way. And then the blessings just come back to bless us over and over again. Well, we know that story through Genesis and Abraham and Sarah are getting ready to go to the promised land. And God made him a promise saying, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to the multitudes on the earth. It wasn't an end in and of itself. It is so that God can continue to work in the world that he so loved he gave his only son. And so for me, that meant not leaving the ministry. I'm still an ordained United Methodist clergy. And and still leaving the sanctuary of the formal congregations to be out in the world or out in the community at the work in terms of helping horses, helping people's needs. Uh, the way that I've come to know it is that most of us plan to retire. How many, how many of you plan to retire today or are in retirement? <laughs> yes? Yeah. Almost none of us plan to age. <laughs> that one always catches us by surprise. What? I, what, what, what do you mean I can't lift this anymore? What do you mean I can't run that distance or do that kind of work anymore? What, what do you mean my fingers don't work the way they used to? And so we just don't tend to make plans to age, and that's why I feel called to help people make those plans. And so for Tracy, the why is 50,000 horses standing without their freedom, family, or familiar way of life. They're running out of time, and we have to do something to help them. For me, it's families are running out of time. Those with senior loved ones don't have a lot of time left. They may not have much health left. And so I'm feeling called to help intergenerational families figure out how to turn fighting into new solutions together. Figure out how to go from toe to toe, or in my world, hoof to hoof, <laughs> fighting, to joining up shoulder to shoulder to figure out how can we support mom or dad. And mom or dad said, how can I let the kids know what I'm thinking and feeling at this season of my life so that we can have all the resources that we need to live the highest quality of life and meaningfulness as long as possible. What we know is that in our culture, with medicines, with housing, with new technology, we can sustain life much, much, much longer 
than it used to be even 20 or 30 years ago. However, is that what we really want? To just live longer? Or perhaps is there an opportunity to live really, really well as long as we're alive? How do we take hold of the life that really is life when our body is wearing out without our permission? When our mind just doesn't work the way it used to and, and things come slower or harder or more challenging? Can we really find a purpose in our worn out bodies, in our weary fatigue? And one of the things that we've discovered since July when I went with the sanctuary of Steadfast Teach full time is that there are so many of us who feel fatigued. In the last month, so we're in October, in October, how many of you have felt fatigued in, in your life, in your energy? Yeah, so you're not alone. I'm not alone. This new ministry has been every bit as exhausting as it has been exciting. It has been very much frightful as much as we have been faithful. And so uh, I, I heard Deepak Chopra mention in a book I was listening to recently, he, he said that if we try in an entrepreneurial spirit to do something with our purpose and our passion to help meet the needs of others, we are more likely to have breakthroughs and breakdowns in one month than employees do in a couple of years. Truly, the breakthroughs and the breakdowns have come in plenty. And we're definitely not out of the woods. We're risking everything as a husband and wife. Let me qualify that. We're risking what we perceive to be everything to do this calling for people of the world. However, I need to qualify that by saying our problems are really first world problems. You know, well, what if we uh, lose our home? We have our health. We have each other. Our daughter, we have an only child. She's married. She has her family. They have their income. So they're, they're not, if, if something happens with Tracy and me in the midst of this calling, they're not going to be in jeopardy. Uh, now our 17 horses will be. That's scary. Some of them are untamed. I don't know how we move them. The reality is that the focus is not what will I lose if I do this. But how can God bless others so that we can do this, right? And trying to walk the talk, and, and believe me, we're not perfect at it. We're doing our struggles as we go along. Means that we're trying to take competencies and passion and meet the needs, the concerns, and the purposes in God's world. So for us, that means taking formerly wild horses and having them help weary people like us. Intergenerational families in transition, employees. Uh, recently this fall, we've had a couple of seminars at Steadfast Eve of employees that are in the human services industry. They give and give and give to others in need, but they suffer from what's called compassion fatigue. The residual emotional effects of helping others and people always need something from us and we just get worn down and stressed out. And so we want to and in partnering with the horses, uh, how they experience unbridled hope, unbridled faith, unbridled confidence in themselves to be able to go back into their regular office, family, or work world and be able to feel like they do have something to offer, especially in the name of God who created us. Here's a major shift then. In, in James Bryan Smith writes a trilogy of books, really neat, practical spirituality for our everyday lives. The first one is called The Good and Beautiful God. The second one is called The Good and Beautiful Life. And the third one is called The Good and Beautiful Community. And within The Good and Beautiful Community, Smith talks about what it means to shift in, in, our, in our stewardship mindset of who we are and what is mine to whose we are and how we can use God, what is God's, to help others. At first, he talks in terms of a false narrative. The false narrative sounds something like this. It's me, mine, me, my, and mine. It's what I've worked for, I've earned. It is mine. My items, uh, my health, my wealth, uh, my relationships are mine because I've worked at them. And therefore, I get to utilize them as I wish, when I wish, to whom I wish. He says that's a false narrative because it takes on entitlement. 
we are entitled to these things because I'm an American, uh, in my case, I'm a white male in America, so on top of the proverbial food chain, and that I work and I do this so that I should be able to get in, you know, so on and so forth, entitlement. However, he says, the true narrative is not what you have, but what is my, me, mine, or mine. It is whose I am. And therefore, as a child of God in whom she delights, the world can't take that away. I am a child of God. And God just delights in my being. And therefore, I want to do things with God that bring joy, bring a smile to God's face, bring joy to the people and the animals and the creation that we serve. And with that narrative, which shifts from entitlement to stewardship, it means that if I'm God, then what I have is, rather than mine, is God. And I am a steward of all of God's possessions. My health, uh, my education, uh, my relationships, calling to work, whatever that might be, is God rather than mine. And that's not dualistic in terms of, uh, oh God, well I guess I don't need to have that anymore. It's more relational and transformational. When I let go of the things, uh, the people, uh, the horses in this case, that would be considered me, mine, or mine, and I say, okay God, this is yours, you have blessed us, be a blessing to others. How can we utilize what we have and whom we're with to meet a purpose or concern in the world? And then everything shifts to, wow, wouldn't it be neat if? And you start imagining how your purpose can meet, a, how your passion can meet a purpose in the world. How your competencies can meet some concerns in the world. And then the meaning in oneself increases and the worry and the anxiety decrease. The what if possibilities begin to come. And the, oh no, what if I fail, begins to let go. So an important question for your pondering and prayer life might be, what would I do if I knew it couldn't fail? What would I do if I knew it couldn't fail? And let the imagination and the spirituality begin to bubble up in terms of what you're already doing to continue doing, as Karina has done with her scars. Or perhaps what you might consider doing if you were a little braver. Remember, it's not yours. You're not, you are not going to be a failure. You can't be. You're a child of God in whom he delights. And so what would you do if you knew it couldn't fail? And then begin to explore that. Well, about a year ago then, I started mentoring with a gentleman who does coaching for intergenerational families with senior level. Now, he lives in New Jersey. However, and, and he doesn't have horses. <laughs> However, he did know how to support families and find all the resources they need for the senior loved ones. And so he taught me so much over this last year as we would Skype regularly, and, he, and I would ask questions and he would teach me about things. What I didn't really imagine is that I would be taking a 900 pound, formerly wild horse to the Commons Assisted Living Facility <laughs> For the average age is 89, by the way. And a lot of the folks are in wheelchairs or walkers. And this horse is huge. In fact, uh, there, are some, there are some postcards I left on the back table of him. His name is Takoda. It's a Sioux, American Indian Sioux word that means friend to everyone. So we put him to the test. All right, Takoda. We're going to take you to the comments. And these are itty bitty little frail persons who are really wise in their lives and in their age. And so you have to be tender and gentle with them, you know? And we took this guy, who was three years old, living in the wild before he was gathered or, or brought in from the wild, and uh, took him to the commons. I, I left some brochures out there as well for some of my people work. So horse work, people work, uh, out on the table there. And what we didn't know when we arrived is that two days before, there was a person, her name is Alan. Allie lives in the fountain, so that's the assisted living that's still under Hilltops uh, Human Services, but just up the road from the common. And on Tuesday of that week, Allie woke up and she was really blue. She was just down. Uh, Allie has dementia. She's, I think, 90 years old, 
and didn't feel good at all that day. So they would try to get her up, they try to brighten her spirits and do what they can, but she was just blue. On Wednesday, they decided, well, one way to perk up her spirits is to tell her that there's a horse coming to visit on Thursday, the next day. Even though they knew that Ali cannot remember nearly <coughs> anything from morning to afternoon or, or afternoon to evening anymore, short-term memory is pretty absent, they knew that it would brighten her spirits in that moment. And so, Wednesday morning, they started telling her, hey, Ali, there's a horse that's going to come and visit you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. A horse? A real horse? And they said, yeah. Some of them didn't know that she grew up on a farm. <coughs> and they used horses as part of their livelihood way back in the day, right? However, anybody who had gone into Ali's room knew that the paintings on the wall of the horses were her paintings. She's an artist. And she had painted those horses and brought incredible passion and, and giftedness and joy to her life. And so when they said, a horse is going to come to visit tomorrow, boy, her spirits perked up. Now, they didn't know how long, because she would forget that. But she was having a better day on Wednesday, certainly, than on Tuesday. Thursday morning came, and somebody in the hallway had heard her calling them, but it was 6 in the morning. They were really concerned about, uh-oh, what's going on? And they found out well, who, who's called from what room, and she was yelling and calling out for the staff to come and help her. And so when they opened the door to see what was wrong, Allie was sitting on the edge of her bed saying, Come on! There's a horse coming today! we got to get ready! <laughs> we could not believe she remembered that a horse was coming, and, and many, many hours of previous to that. And she said, We have to do my nails and do my hair and... To Hilltop's affirmation, her staff person shifted their responsibilities and they shifted staff people around so that this staff person could spend the next couple of hours <laughs> painting her nails, doing her hair, making sure her makeup was good and all her clothing was good so that they could wheel her down to the common so that by 10 a.m. when Dakota arrived, and Tracy's the, the one that was had, had her hand on his leg rope and standing in the grass. And they wheeled Allie up there. Allie looked up at this horse. And I gotta tell you, that horse's head was from Allie's head to her lap. You know, it just covered her whole being. And when that horse bent down, and Allie had his face, knowing that she had grown up with horses, that she painted them through her life, and that now she had this precious moment where in her memory was only in the present moment. Could have this engaged experience. Was a moment when I experienced God coming back to bless those who He is a blessing for. The coat is not mine. The work is not ours. We are children of God participating in the ways that He wants to bless in and through us to be a blessing to other people. And I kid you not, I stood, sat there as I stood next to her, and she had a 10-minute lucid conversation about breeding and other kinds of words that I don't know what it's talking about. I learned something from Allie that day. Dakota, a formerly wild horse, who's touching the staff and the people and the owners alike. He has no words. He's an animal of prey. He only knows how to cooperate. He doesn't know how to compete. And the lesson that we get to learn then from Dakota and other horses like him is that in times when we feel like we've lost our freedom, our family, our familiar way of life, because our bodies and our minds have aged without our permission, because we've lost everything we have financially, because materialism, the materials that we have are broken and they wear out as well, because some relationships can't handle our change of life or season, and so they tend to back away or fade away. That whenever we might consider that we don't have our family or our familiar way of life or our freedom anymore, we still know there is a purpose that God has for each one of us to live fully as long as we're alive. And so unbridled faith for me means taking off the saddle, taking off the halter, and being at liberty to say, all right, God, you know 
my energy level, you know my mental abilities, you know my season of life. And so use me in ways that are absolutely miraculous. One of the definitions of faith that I love most is that risking something so great for God's sake that if he is not intervening in it, it would surely fail. Risk something so great for God's sake that if he is not intervening in it, it would surely fail. I don't know how our story is going to turn out. But I know one thing. There will never be failures as long as we are trying to serve the one who gave us the mind, the body, the spirit, the relationships to serve. And, and so maybe, maybe the question isn't what would you do if you knew that it couldn't fail? Maybe the real question in faith an unbridled faith is what would you do for God's sake even if you knew it could fail? And then perhaps we will take hold of the life that really is life. Unbridled freedom and knowing that nothing in this world can strip us of our belonging, of our relationships, of our well-being because it was never the world's to begin with. That whose we are and who we're with is all a part of God's work. In Psalm 36, David is praying to God. And he uses the beautiful nature that we see so often in Western Colorado. When he says, Lord, your steadfast love extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Did you see the clouds this morning? Oh, beautiful sunrise. Your righteousness is like the great mountains in the east and west. And your justice is like the great deep. And then he continues his prayer. For you save humans and animals alike, O oh God. How precious is your steadfast love. That is the life that we as a congregation, as a community, and as individuals who are gods, are called to risk, to try, to explore, to find that new freedom that can only come from unbridled faith. So help me out one more time. When I say God is, you say it good. God is yeah. all the time. Praise the Lord.